when I was a student, I thought language is mostly about communication. It's not. Language is about thought. Language is, is an expression, if that makes sense, which is how why these transformers work so well. They look like they're thinking because they're able to use language, which is, can I tell you something funny about linguistics? Let's go. All right. So when I was a student, I was really turned off by linguistics, which is about, which is why I went into uh, vis visual perceptual neurophysiology. Yes? The idea is, as a neuroscientist, you study one of the following four things. You study uh, perception, which is the back of the brain, language, which is the front of the brain, uh, motor action, which is also in the front, or like emotion, which is kind of in the middle or below. This is a gross oversimplification of any neuroscientists are watching. I apologize. But broadly. And I was really turned off by linguistics, I, like badly. Because Chomsky, as you know, in the 50s said something like this. Language is not associative because of the poverty of stimulus argument. The idea is that a child does not need to learn, hear that much language to generalize, yes? So his argument was that it's not associative. It's poverty of stimulus. The idea is that meaning follows from syntax, from grammatical rules, yes? And emerges like that. I never thought that, that that didn't make any sense to me. I'll tell you why. I speak the following four languages. Swabian, my native language. German. English, I would argue reasonably well, yes. And a little bit of French, yes. I could, I could not name a single grammatical rule in any of these languages to you explicitly. I could not. I can't. I don't know any of the grammatical rules in any of these languages. But you would agree that I speak English reasonably well? Right. Okay. So what do I think is going on? I think you learn a language, particularly the meaning of the language, by immersion, by using it. Yes. But that flies right in the face of Chomsky. He's like, no, 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 no. The, it's top down. You understand the syntactic rules, which then creates a generative grammar, which then gener generates language. Yes. What the chatbot shows and the transformer architecture is ironic. The linguists, they were pretty much all trained by Chomsky or, their stu or his students, were wrong about language, which is why they're so angry. If you look, look at Gary Marcus online, he's so angry about the AI people because if the AI people are right, then he and his entire intellectual language are wrong about language, which is a bad thing to be wrong about if you spend your whole life studying that. Yes? But let me tell you what I mean by that. What the maybe we should talk about the transformer architecture very brief, very briefly, because we could spend an entire three-hour interview just on that. But let's make it break it down. Okay, here's how it works. You take a corpus of text. I don't know all of the documents that you find online, all of Reddit. Yes, what could go wrong? Yes, and you break that into tokens. For now, just say words, but there's also parts of words or exclamation marks and. Any, any, anything in there could be a token. And then you look at the probability distribution of these tokens. So uh, to whom it may, what's the conditional probability that you're going to see? Concern. Concern, if you saw that, it's pretty much one, yes. So you do all these probability distributions. Then, how do I say this? For, so this is called engram, mod engram modeling. Mm -hmm. So for long term, people did that, but you have all kinds of technical problems I don't want to get into that make this hard, but worse, language understanding depends also on context. Give me an example. If I say bank, it's a classic example. Do you know if this is a river bank or a money bank? And the answer is you don't. That depends on the context. If I say he deposits his check in the bank, then you know it's a money, money bank. bank. And then you can say whatever the next word prediction would be, I don't know, what are you going to predict? And maybe then he withdraws it or something like that. Right. Or as I say, the crocodile lay on the bank and the river rose or something like that. So the next word prediction depends on the context, yes? Right. And so for a long time, people model as with what's called an RNN, a recurrent neural network. So in other words, you, you um, explicitly represent this context, this sequence in memory. And the next word, talk, the next token prediction depends both on the current token and all and what's in your memory, yes? But as you can imagine, the memory is going to get very full or crowded out by what you saw recently. So long sentences you couldn't understand like that. So if you read Kant, where the meaning of the entire sentence might depend on a word you saw 
a thousand words earlier, well, then you can't do it, yes? Yeah. That's a problem with RNNs. And there was all kinds of ways to fix that with LSTMs. But to make a long story short, mm -hmm. what the transformer architecture is, and let me just walk you through it briefly, is you take the word and you represent it in a embedding space in, in a, as a vector, yes? And in ChatGPT 2, I think it was 768 dimensions. In ChatGPT 3, it's like 12,000 something. And 4, it's not even disclosed what it is. But it's a high dimensional space, yes? So you vectorize the word in this 12,000 dimensional, high dimensional vector space, initially at random, by the way, before you learn. And then what you do, and that's where the attention architecture comes in. That's why attention is all you need. You do away with these sequential bottlenecks. You do something very odd. When I first read about it, I was like, I don't think I understand this because this cannot be true. Yeah. But it is. You do all pairwise, you do all pairwise dot products. I mean, you're not going to go into details of the query value, key matrix, but to make a long story short, you do dot product projections and every entry in the attention matrix is set by these dot products. Uh, but what you do is you do determine the relevance of each word based on each other word. So as a computer scientist, you're going to get stomach aches just hearing that because that's, that means it's O of N squared, which means it's prohibitively competitive. So you move the bottleneck from a conceptual bottleneck or memory bottleneck to a computational bottleneck. But luckily for us, we now have GPUs and you can compute dot products of all of these projections in this matrix in parallel and then life is good. So you might have to compute a sextillion dot products to train your transformer. By the way, it's called transformer because this initial vector representation of the word is transformed by taking the context into account of the other words, yes? Right. So let's say what word could I give you? Uh, he went to the, he couldn't go to the bank because the river was too high. Is it a, is it a money bank or a, a river bank? River bank. Great. And which words determine that? Which two words determine, determine that? I guess the river and being high. Right? Great, river and high. So the attention weights would be high for those two words, but not for the other ones. That's that's all, all you need to know. But you need to compute all of those relevant scores. By the way, attention is a terrible name for this because attention implies, if I say, hey, pay attention to me, that means it's a, it is a bottleneck. You pay attention to me over everything else. Whereas this, ironically, the wave of bottleneck. So it's more like, I would call it the awareness might matrix or the vibe matrix. The idea is how much does other things matter, color the meaning of this word. So the idea here is, Meaning emerges as an emergent property of how of associativeness. And if this is true, then Chomsky is wrong. Then associ the associativeness, associative, the associative approach to language is true. Basically, language acquires meaning by using it or how it's used. I mean, there's a similar analogy in physics. Nobody taught me physics before I learned how to catch a ball, right? Okay. I could just You can catch you're absolutely right. right. You can catch a ball. Yeah. No without, one taught me the trajectory or the angle of the screen. Without knowing any physics. That's correct. And it seems that language as well, no one taught me syntax before I could just mimic my parents Very speaking. Good. Very good. But Chomsky would say you're wrong. You're wrong. You did not learn that from your parents. And and here, here is two arguments. Number one, you didn't hear that much language. Because the downside of the transformers, you need a lot of data. Yes? And so he's right about that. You have a learning algorithm that's much more efficient than that. And the second thing is, the second argument is kids make mistakes that you have never heard. So, so he said, this is why associativeness cannot be true. But he's wrong. Again, if transformers can handle language, and it looks like they can, con compellingly to a point where it passes the Turing test, yeah, he's wrong, which is hilarious, if you think about it. So I was right to have a distaste about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? And maybe I'm going to go back into language now. That sounds very interesting. I'm all down with studying language if I can be studied from an associative perspective. This, this, this syntax stuff just never made sense to me. I just didn't. You know what I mean?